Okay, AB Computer Science A, uh, multiple choice packets, uh, unit six, arrays and array lists. Now, um, in the fall, we're just gonna do problems one through 27 that only that deal with one dimensional arrays and array lists. Um, we haven't talked about two dimensional arrays yet, but we will um, in the second semester and that's when we will do the problems 28 to 37. So if your packet has all the way up to 37, and it's the fall, we're just gonna do a problem 27. Um, otherwise, maybe your packet just has those. Um, okay, so this is all about arrays and array lists, which we've been using a lot lately. So uh, which of the following correctly initializes an array ARR to contain four elements, each with the value of zero. So uh, you need to uh, declare it with the right type. So these are all good. Um, this is a shortcut way to put a bunch of values into an array the very first time, so that's okay. If you just create it with size 4 and you don't put any values in it, and they're type int, it will actually by default fill it with zeros. Okay. Um, if, if they're of type int. So that actually works. And in this one, we do it, and this is kind of like the most full-blown Kind of like, okay, let's use a for loop and fill it with zeros. That works too. So the, these all work. One, two, and three all work. Um, all right, next one. The following program segment is intended to find, find the index of the first negative integer when ARR is an array of n array. So n integers, we start at zero. That's why it goes up to n minus one. So we're trying to find the index, the location of the first negative number. So um, I'm assuming this i is probably the thing to store it or something, maybe, I don't know, let's see. So this says, while ARR is greater than or equal to zero, keep increment this. So this is kind of like a for loop. And it's saying, let's keep, let's keep track of where we're at. Let's see if it's positive. While it's positive, let's keep going. And so this is only going to go while we hit positive numbers. As soon as we hit a negative number, psh, this is done. And the location that we're at would be the negative. Now this says this segment will work as intended. Always, never. Um, it looks good, but I would be skeptical of going with always. I mean, it seems good. What we probably need to figure out is if there's any kind of special case. I don't think it's never. This says contains at least one negative integer. Well, if there are no negative integers and it, it would then return, it would actually return, if there's no negative integers, it'd end up returning the last spot. Or actually, uh, if there were no negative integers, you're gonna get an index out of bounds exception. Right, because it's gonna. This is gonna keep going up, keep going up. There's no check to make sure that we don't go beyond the end of the array. So that's the immediate concern. My other concern is it would return the last spot if there was some check to make sure it didn't go out of bounds. So uh, yes, it needs to contain at least one negative integer. Otherwise, problems are gonna happen. At least one non-negative integer. No, they could all be negative. It would work if the first one was negative contains at least no negative integers. Contains at least no negative integers. Um, no, it needs at least one negative integer. And it would be weird. So, uh, uh, contains at least one non-negative integer. That's not necessary. So, it seemed like it was always, but we figure out that if it doesn't have a negative integer, we're gonna get problems. Refer to the following code segment. You may assume the AR is an array of int uh, values. Um, int sum equals the first spot and i equals zero. So we do a while loop and go through the array. So we need a counter, and that's what the i is. And it starts at zero. It says while i is less than the length, then let's increment it and then add the current spot to the current running. Now you'll notice that we did this first, which is necessary because we already added this guy. And uh, so we wanna make sure that we increment it before we add the next one, okay? So it seems good. And which of the following will 
will be the result of executing the segment. It seems like it's going to add everything starting at zero until the last one, because when I equal, well, well we're going to be careful when I equals array dot length minus one, it's going to be the last time. And then it's going to increment it and I is going to equal array dot length. And then we're going to try and pull the value out of that. And we're going to get an out of bounds exception. This is not going to be good. You get out of bounds exception. Uh, runtime, and that's a runtime error. So that's my thing. It's not going to be infinite. Infinite would be it just goes on forever. So it's not going to be infinite. I mean, it seems like it's going to add them all up, right? Um, this just doesn't make sense. This is what is going to happen that's going to cause the out of bounds error. We want it to only go up to the second to last array. Uh, array dot length minus one because array dot length doesn't exist. Um, so it's just we're gonna it's gonna it's gonna have an out of bounds exception. Um, all right, next one. So this says, refer the following code. You may assume that array ARR1 contains elements 0 to n minus 1 and is array length. That all sounds good. Count is 0. Um, you're going to have a for loop that looks like it goes through the whole thing. If the current spot is not equal to 0, then we want to uh, move the current spot into count. So this is going to be moving potential if it's not equal to zero, we move it and we increase the count. It sounds like it's going to replace all the zero terms. If it's zero, nothing happens. And then we keep going, but we're slowly moving all the non-zero terms down to an earlier part of the array. Then we have a second array that's a new array that's equal to count which is going to be equal to all the number of non-zero terms. And then we're going to go through and move all of those new non-zero terms that are at the beginning of the array into this new array that's sized just perfectly to hold them. And we'll just ignore the rest. If, AR, if array ARR initially contains 0, 6, 0, 4, 0, 0, 2 in this order, what will array 2 contain after execution? My prediction is it's going to contain 6, 4, 2, unless something bad happens or something i missed some weird thing you could test it out you could say okay well originally you know you have your index equal to zero one two three four five six and the value are zero six zero four zero zero two so this is what it initially is count equals zero and then it says, if it's not equal to zero, well, the first one is equal to zero. So then um, nothing happens, right? Count is still zero. So your index was zero. Then it goes to one. And it says, well, is that spot not equal to zero? It isn't. And so what happens is it says, okay, well, let's move what's in the current spot I, one, six, and move it into count zero. So now... The array is going to look like this. But what happens is you still have a 6 there. We're not swapping them. We're just copying this value here. Then we go to index equals 2. We say, well, is that not 0? And by the way, count is now 1, which is kind of holding the spot for the next non-zero. Even though there's a 6 there, we're going to cover it up because it's just a, a duplicate. 2 isn't a 0, so then it goes to 3 and says, oh, hey, this isn't a 0, so let's put that into count 1, and then everything else in the array stays the same. And then count goes to 2, holding the spot for the next place. So then we go index equals 4, it's 0, nothing happens. 5, it's 0, nothing happens. 6 is a 2. Oh, okay, so it's going to be 6, 4, 2. The rest of the array is 4, 0, 0, 2. But this is really what we're concentrating on. We've moved all the original non-zero terms to the front. Count gets incremented to 3. So then we use that down here to create an array of size 3. Perfect perfectly sized to hold these. And then we copy them in one at a time from 
this array, but only these first three spots into this array that only has three spots. So it, it looks like it's going to work. Um, so, okay. Um, I mean, at first, you know, ARR2 is just going to equal 0, 0, 0. And then it's going to, when I equals 0, it's going to put the 6 in. And then when I equals 1, it's going to put the 4 in. And when I equals 2, it's going to put the 2 in. And that's what we're going to have. Okay, that's what ARR2 is going to have. This is what ARR1 still has. It has all this extra stuff at the end. Number 5, consider this program segment. Uh, it's a for loop that starts at 2. And it says if error one is less than some value, then system dot print out small. Just print the word small. What's the maximum number of times that small can be printed? Uh, well, I mean, you could just you can imagine, you know, let's say it's zero 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 and i equals zero one two three four, and some value is bigger than zero. The thing is, is it skips these first two spots and goes to this one and says, is it less than them? Okay, print out small. And then it goes to this one. Okay, print out small. And then it goes to this one, print out small. So imagining <clears throat> extreme scenario that they're all smaller than some value. The first two get ignored though. The size of this, <clears throat> uh, now by the way, K isn't necessarily even the size. That could just be where we decide to stop, right? So it looks like it's going to go up to K. Um, K is this whole number here, and we take away two because we're skipping the first two. And But we do include K. So I'm going to say that it's going to be K minus two. Ooh, that's K minus one. Um, okay. Let's say K equals four in this case, right? K equals four, then we got three of them. So I guess it's actually K minus one. K minus one. Um, Cause K includes zero. I guess that's the thing. K includes zero and then we subtract two. So if K equals four, we subtract two, then you get two on that. We gotta do K minus one. Um, it's definitely not these guys. It's not all of them. It's got to be C or D. I can see a lot of people going for D because I almost did. Okay, number six. What will the what will be the output of the following code segment? Assuming it is in the same class as the do something method. So here's uh, the do something method. It takes a, an array of integers and sets it equal to list. And then it goes through that whole array and puts the value of i into those spots. Okay? So uh, there's this original array ARR, which equals 1, 2, 3. And we're going to, that's what we're going to put in here is 1, 2, 3, 4. And then int b is going to reference that same array. So this is the array. One, two, three, four. This is this is ARR is referencing that. And then and then we're gonna put that in here. And so list is gonna reference that. And now B is gonna reference that. And we're gonna go through and replace the values with whatever the I value is. So that's gonna be a zero, that's gonna be one, that's gonna be two, that's gonna be three. That's what it looks like happens. And then we're gonna print out what's in the first spot on index one. So that would be a one and then print out what's in the th in index three. So I think that's going to be three. Um, so it looks like we're going to, we're going to print out one and three. That's it. One, three. So this is kind of going back to this whole object stuff. Arrays are like objects. So, we have we can have things referencing them. You know, once this method is gone, then the B goes away and the list goes away, and you're left with this. But we made changes to it. We were able to make changes through it through the references.
Um, so even though we pass things by value into methods, if it's an object, then we're passing the reference, the value of the reference, which gives you access to the object. So you can use getters and setters to make changes into it. You can't create new objects in it. You can't create new arrays. You can't set things to null. You can use getters and setters and so forth. Okay. Consider writing a program that reads the lines of any text file into a sequential list of lines. Which of the following is a good reason to implement the list with an array list of strings rather than an array of string objects? So the benefits of array lists is that they can change size, right? And so if you don't know the size, then the array list works out better. You have to know the size for an array. So the get methods of array lists are more convenient. No, I don't think so. I think they're actually less convenient than the quote, uh, the bracket annotation. Uh, the size method of array list can, provides instant access to the length of the list. Yeah, but so does the length method of an array. And it doesn't really give you instant access to the length of the list. It, it's until it's all read in, will you actually know how big it is? You know, I mean, it does tell you how big it is at that particular instant, whatever, wherever you're at. An array list can contain objects of any type, which leads to greater generality. Mm, so, uh, but what if they're going to be, you know, they're, uh, you know, what if they're, what if, what if you want to do primitives? Array list can't hold primitives. So I don't really, that's, arrays can hold any object type too. D, if any particular text file is unexpectedly long, the array list will automatically be resized. The array, by contrast, may go out of bounds. Yes, I think that sounds good. String methods are easier to use in array lists than array. No. So the whole, the whole benefit of this is that you don't have to know the size. It'll make it as big as it needs to, which is nice. And you won't have to worry about going out of bounds like you would with an array. So, um, consider writing a program that reduces a uh, program. Uh, consider writing a program that produces statistics um, for long lists of numerical data. Which of the following is the best reason to implement? each list with an array of int or double rather than an array list of integer objects. So remember, array list can't hold primitives, so then you have to use these wrapper classes, the integer double class. So you write a program that produces statistics for long lists of numerical data. What would be the benefit of an array of an array list? An array of primitive number types is more efficient to manipulate than an array list of wrapper objects. I'd say, yeah, that kind of sounds right because these wrapper objects, you have to make them and then you got to pull the stuff out of them and then you got to put them back in them. It's a lot of extra work. So this one seems like a good reason to avoid that. Insertion of new elements into a list is easier to code for an array than array list. No, it is not. Insertion is way easier for array list. Uh, removal is easier in array than array list. No, removal is much easier than array list. Accessing individual elements in the middle of the list is easier for an array than an array list. No, I'd say that they're the same. Accessing all elements is more efficient in an array than an array list. No, I don't think so. So I think the biggest benefit would be not having to create these integer and double objects, you know, because that's just a lot of extra work. Um, So 9 through 12 refer to the following information, public class address. So private instance variables, name, street, city, state, zip code. You have getters. You have a student class that has an ID number, GPA address. You have getters there. So you have an address class with so basic address information, a student class, and getters for all those. So a client method has the declaration followed by code to initialize the list. So it's creating a list. Now, uh, um, this is a this is an array of address objects, and it's going to hold 100 address objects. Here's a code segment to generate the, a list of names only. This is a for each loop. 
So this is going through the whole list, pulling out, copying the addresses one at a time into this variable A, which is the correct line of code to generate the list of names only. So system dot out to print all in sounds good. We need to access it from A and A is a copy and we use get name. I think that's it right there, D. So all these other ones, you don't actually have access to the address array in here. And there is no I, there's no counter. If it was a regular for loop, that's how you would do it. Um, and that's not even the name of the array, it would be list, but still can't do it. There is no I. Um, the, again, there is no I for A. There's just no I, there's no counter. You can't do list I get name because that's the whole list. So you want to use the copy of each address object one at a time and call get name on it. It is an address object, so you can use methods from the address class on it. So, um, okay. Uh, this would be the way if we did like a regular for loop, but a for each loop, we could do it this way. Okay, 10, the following code segment is to print out a list of addresses. Okay, so similar idea, which is correct request some code for more code. So you wanna print out the addresses. So I guess you gotta print out the name, street, city, state, zip code all separately, maybe. And so, uh, but we're using, we're using a for each loop, so all of those don't make sense. It's gotta be address, 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 address. So this, uh, that one doesn't look good. So this one looks good. That one doesn't look good. And the last one just says, just put the address in it. Well, does it have a two string? Um, I didn't see a two string. So I think that's going to be a bad idea. It's going to just print out some, because it's an array, it's going to print a bunch of stuff out like in a weird format because it doesn't have, doesn't have a two string. Okay, it'll do something. It's probably just going to be a mess. So I think I'm going to go with two only. Uh, 11, a client method has this declaration, student, all students. So this is an array of student objects. NumStudes is a constant number of students. Here's a code segment to generate a list of student names only. You may assume that all students have been initialized. It's a for each loop copying them into student. Um, and so we just want to print out the name only. So we want to use student dot. Uh, now, the student class doesn't have their names, right? It's actually in an address, has an address, and the address has a name. So we have to, we have to get the address, which is a getter for that. In the student class, we have to call get address and then get name on get address because the names are stored in the address. So this doesn't make sense because you got to use student, student. All these other ones just don't make sense that have that. This one looks close to good, but it, there isn't a name in the student class. The name is stored in the address object that's in the student class. So we have to do C. Um, all right, going. 12, here is a method that locates a student with the highest ID number, precondition array, student array, student is initialized, return a student with the highest ID number. So you return a student object. Um, and it says, which of the following code, uh, following could replace method body so that the method works as intended. So they're setting, they're creating a variable max and they're putting the first student's ID number in it. We've said that's a really good strategy for, for um, searching for a max and min is to set the first one. Then they're using a for each loop to go through the whole thing and say, if the current student's ID number is bigger than, than max equals student ID number, and then return the student. This this is too soon. You have to go through the whole. You need to go through, go through, the whole array list before you know if you found the max. 
this is just going to return the first bigger one. And then it returns the first student if that doesn't happen. So there's some stuff in here. I feel like we need to keep track of who the biggest student is. We're just keeping track of the ID. We need to re return the student, not return their ID. So um, this one stores the first student in the highest student so far, and then also stores their max their their max uh, get ID number. And then we're going to go through the whole thing and check, is the ID number of this one bigger than the max? If it is, set that as your new max, but also store the student so far, and then return it when you're done. So that looks good. Um, this one says max position. So another way is to store the location of that student and use that to find the student's name and, or student and also their, their, their ID number. So we're going to use a regular for loop here and go through the whole, we're going to skip the first one because we're going to go ahead and by default just set the first one there to the max so far. And then we're going to say, okay, well, let's get the student at the current spot, get their ID number, compare it to the student, the student with the max ID number, but you have to use the getter on it because we're not actually storing the ID number. If we find a bigger one, then that's our new position. So we go through the whole thing. Now the lack of curly braces here is because that these just have one line of code. The for loop just has an if in it. The if just has this line of code. So this would be the same thing that after you're all the way done, you're gonna return whatever it is. So I think that one should work. So I'm gonna say uh, two and three only. Two and three only. So these Roman numeral problems are tough because it could be all of them, a couple of them, none of them. The next chunk of problems, 13 through 15, uses uh, the public class ticket. Okay, so it has a string for row, seat, and price. Has a constructor, multi constructor, has getters. Okay. There's also another class called transaction, and the transaction class has an array of ticket objects. And we also have a uh, a private instance variable for the num of tickets, the number of tickets. So this constructor says num tickets equals num tickets, ticket list equals new ticket of the right size, string equals the row, int equals the seat, double equals the price, so seem like kind of like temporary variables. Then we have a, a for loop that goes through the whole thing, reads user input. So we're going to get the row, the seat, and the price from the user and create all the tickets as the, they're going to give it return total amount paid for this transaction, uh, public double total paid, double total equals zero initially, then you calculate the total paid, which is probably going to go through all the prices and add them up. Which of the following correctly replaces the more code in the transaction constructor initialized ticket array list? So uh, read user input from... The, for the row, the seat, and the price. So we already have those. You don't need to worry about that. It's here, we gotta put them in. So we need to create a new ticket. So it's gotta be new ticket, right? New ticket object, um, which is that previous one, and we gotta use its constructor. Now, we're not gonna use get row, we're gonna use the row, the seat, and the price the row, the C, and the price. We're not gonna use these getters. And all these other ones are bad because they're not ticket objects. So it's gotta be B. I know A looks attractive, but these are just variables that came in from the user. So we have them. Don't use the getters. Uh, which, pres which represents the correct code to calculate the amount for the total paid? So. We can do a for loop or for each loop. These all kind of look like for each loop. So for each loop, going through the whole ticket list, ticket objects, doing t.getPrice. The ticket has a getPrice method. This looks good. Uh, ticket list. No, we're not going to, if we're doing a for each loop, you can't do that. You need to use the copy. You got to use t, right? Um, now, here's the thing. To get the price, we've got to use get price. So I think this one's bad because it's not using it. You need the getter, right? You need the getter. So I noticed that this one has the getter, and I'm like, oh, that's better. 
So this one looks good, I think. This one creates a transaction T variable. That doesn't make any sense. Transaction, we don't, no, T itself, it, the transaction object isn't an array itself. So that's just weird. That just doesn't make sense on either of these. So it's gotta be C, it's gotta be C. Um, all right, 15, uh, suppose, let's see, so we go to okay. So 15 says, suppose it's necessary to keep a list of all ticket transactions, assuming that there are num sales transactions, a suitable declaration would be, okay, so we're going to create a, okay. So ticket transactions, a transaction has multiple seats, but now we're going to have multiple transactions. So we're going to create an array of transaction objects, new transaction num sales. Uh, that looks good because I think we want to hold transaction objects. This one doesn't make sense because we're not going to hold tickets and tickets are going to be inside. Um, we're not going to create the, the, we're not going to make the, reference of type ticket and then make it a transaction. So I think these are out. And then list of sales doesn't make sense. That's not even a type. So I think it's gotta be, it's gotta be A. I'm gonna create an array of transaction objects to keep track of all the transactions. 16, the following code segment is intended to find the smallest value in an array. Okay, so we've done this kind of thing before, so we have some good ideas. Ray goes from zero to n minus one, n is the size, post condition, the min will have the smallest value. Uh, so uh, we set the min to the first spot. And so instead of using a for loop, we're gonna use a while loop. We say, well, let's set i to one, because we already started at zero. While i is less than n, the size, we're gonna increment it and then check if current spot is less than min. Now, the thing I don't like about this is that we're going to immediately go to i equals two. We're going to skip, we're going to skip i equals one. That's going to be one problem. Also, I think we can get an out of bounds exception when i equals the last, when i is n minus one, that's okay. But then we, so I think the solution here, by the way, so I've, I've noticed a problem. I haven't even looked at the question. I've noticed the problem. I think this really would be better if it came after the fact. That would fix all our problems. It would, it would fix skipping the first one. It would fix the out of bounds exception. It says the code is incorrect. For the segment to work as intended, which of the following modifications need to be made? Change the line int i equals one to int i equals zero. Well, that would fix skipping it, but that would fix one problem, but it wouldn't fix the out of bounds. Okay, we're still gonna have that problem because we're incrementing it after we check to make sure we're okay to fit in and then we're incrementing it, we're going one past the end. Change the body of the while loop to do this and then to do this afterwards. I think that should have a semicolon. That looks good. I think that one's a good one. Change the test and while loop as follows to i is less than or equal to one. Well, that would fix the out of bounds. No, that wouldn't fix the out of bounds exception you would want to change it to like i is less than like n minus one. That would fix it. But you would also want to start i at zero so that when it increments it. If you made these two changes, that would work. But so we're gonna go with two only. Okay, 17, refer to the method match below. It says param v is an array of int sorted in increasing order. So v is increasing, w is increasing. Uh, n is the number of elements in v. So n is the size of that one. m is the size of w. 
uh, returns true if there is an injured K that occurs in both arrays, otherwise it returns false. So we're looking to see, is there something that happens in both of them? And so, uh, and they're in order. They're both in increasing order. So we're probably gonna try and take advantage of that. So this says public static Boolean match. You take the two arrays and their sizes, um, which I don't think is necessary. You could do dot length to get their sizes. We set V index to zero and W index to zero. So we're gonna use a, a while loop instead of like a for loop. And we're gonna go through both of them at the same time. And we're gonna say, okay, if V index is less than N, N and W index is less than N, that's to make sure we don't go past the end of one of them. Whichever one's shorter is going to make this stop sooner. Because um, if you've gone through, yeah. So then if their index is equal, then you just return true right away and you're done. Otherwise, if they're not equal and V1 is less than W, then you want to bump that one up. So if this one's less than this one and they're increasing in order, maybe the next one in this one will be equal to that. So we're going to leave this one. We're going to leave this one and increase this one because this one's less than that. And we know they're in order. So maybe when I go to the next biggest one, they might be equal. Okay. Now, if the next biggest one is bigger than this one, then we, we skip this. Otherwise, uh, if this one's smaller than that, then we increase this to try and match it. Otherwise, if this one's smaller than that one, then we do the same idea and increase this one instead and leave that one the same, okay? And if you get to the end and you haven't returned the true, that means it didn't have in false. Assuming that the method has not been exited, which assertion is true at the very end of every execution of the while loop? What is true at the end of every execution of the while loop? And while it hasn't been returned. Well, it says that V0 to V index by 1 and W0 to W index contain no common value. Well, uh, no, not for sure. That would be the whole array. We don't, well, no, this says index. So we don't have any common value so far, it sounds like. And this is me less than or equal to index, and this is me less than or equal to M. Um, I feel like that one looks good. This one says, and it's V index minus one because we've incremented V index or W. We've incremented one of them. So one of them, uh, we haven't checked it yet. We have to go back up to the beginning of the while loop and then check it. Um, so I think that one looks good. This one I think needs to be minus one, minus one. That's the problem with that one. And it is possible, by the way, that V index or W index actually equals N or N, the size of the array, which is one past the end of the array. So that's why on these ones, I think you would get rid of the minus ones because we've incremented them. We haven't tested them yet. So they might be equal to N or N. So, um, okay. And the next one, I think we need to do minus one, minus one. And these ones shouldn't have the minus one. So there's like every possible variation here. Uh, these, that looks good. Um, let's see. So, oh, the mistake here, this is doing the whole array. We haven't gone through the whole array yet. So that one's out. So it's going to be A. A is so far, that's what is true. Um, Eighteen public class book. I have the title, author, checkout status, and then we have a constructor, and then we have a change status. Change the checkout status. That's a mutator. Uh, client program. Another program has creates an array of these books. Okay. Suppose book list is initialized so that each book in the list has a title, author, checkout status. The following piece of code is written. Whose intent is to change? The checkout status of each book in the book list. We want to change them all. Now we're using a for each loop and we're copying the books into B and we're calling change status, so it should flip it. So it seems like seems like this is gonna work. 
but you know, I'm always skeptical. I'm assuming there might be some weird thing that I didn't, I didn't like on the surface. This looks good. The book list array will remain unchanged after execution. No, I think it's gonna work. Each book is gonna has changed. I think that's right. Let's just look at it. No point exception, Kurt. No, there's no no books. Right? It says that they all have a title, author, and checkout status. So I don't think that's going to happen. Runtime error occurs because it's not possible to modify objects using a for each loop. It is not possible to change the value of B, the reference, but you can use the reference to use muta mutators in an object to actually make changes to it. Even in a for each loop, you can do it. A logic error occurred because it's not possible to modify objects in an array without accessing, accessing indexes of the objects. No, that's fine. That kind of sounds like D. So everything's cool. This one surprisingly does its job correctly. Um, Okay, let's see. 19 to 20, refer to the following method of information. A bingo card class has an array of cards, I guess bingo cards or something. Um, and then there's a constructor and then a display class. A program that simulates a bingo game, so there's multiple bingo cards in a bingo game, different people have bingo cards declares an array of bingo card. The array has num player elements where each element represents the card of a different player. Here's the code segment that creates all the bingo cards in the game. Declare array of bingo card, construct each bingo card. Which of the following is the correct replacement for declare array of bingo cards? So we got we need to declare the array of, of bingo cards. So it's gonna hold card or it's gonna hold uh, it's going to hold integers, right? So, um, wait, wait. a program that simulates, simulates a bingo game declares an array of bingo card. So it's definitely got to be an array of bingo cards. So it's got to be bingo card. It can't be that. It's got to be bingo card players, new. Got to do new. It's not going to be an int. Bingo card. We shouldn't just set it equal to 20. We should use the number of players. So I think D is what we're going for here. It's got to be an array of bingo cards. You got to use new bingo card and then, and then num players. Don't just arbitrarily set it to 20. 20, assuming that players has been declared as an array of bingo card, which of the following uh, is a correct replacement for construct each bingo card? So this just holds, has spots for bingo cards, but they haven't been created yet. So we're going to go through the whole players uh, array and copy uh, them into the bingo cards. And then card equals, here's the problem. You can't do this in a for each one because card's a copy. And, and it doesn't even exist yet. It's null, I think, right? So we can't, we can't replace elements um, in an array uh, with through a for each loop can do it you need a regular for loop so that's gonna be a problem there this is a for each loop and this just doesn't even make sense because you're copying this in a card and card is like a bingo card and you're trying to act like it's the counter. That's really off. Here's a for loop, maybe promising. It says, all right, in the first spot, let's create a new bingo card. So I think that one's good, three only. So you gotta understand what you're limited to doing with four each loops and four loops. Which declaration will cause an error? list string so list array list by the way are in the list class so you can make the reference more broad so that's kind of a weird thing we haven't talked a lot about but this is like an array list of strings called string list and then you can make it more specific now you can't do it the other way okay here we create a list of ints 
And then we try and let's see. Okay, this is bad because array list can't hold primitives. That's just that makes it just can't hold primitives, can't hold ints. Here's an array list of string objects. Okay, that looks good. So one and three only. Uh, one is sneaky because, wait, actually, sorry, which one will cause an error? I did my mistake. Two is the bad one, All right? So we're looking for the bad one here. Um, array list cannot hold primitives. Can't do it. Okay, 22. Uh, here's a list, more broadly list, array list. Strings are objects. That's fine. String ch has a blank line integer int object is a new integer object which statement will cause an error um, str list which is supposed to hold strings you're going to add the string that's fine string list i add new string handy andy okay that looks fine um string list add int object to two string so assuming the integer object class has a two string that would work uh, string list I add ch plus eight now concatenation says that if you add a string to like uh, another primitive or something it makes it all string so that's actually okay this one in object is like an integer object I'm trying to add it to an int there's no strings at all in there so it's not going to automatically change them to strings so this is going to be the one that causes the mistake um let list be an array list containing these elements uh now they're integer objects that's why they're allowed which the following statements would not cause an error assume that each statement applies to the given list independent of the other statements Okay, we can create an object and put list dot get six out of it. Yeah, that's fine because we're creating it as a more broad. Uh, well, here's the problem here. Let's see, zero, one, two, three, four, five. This is going to give you out of bounds exception. That's the big deal there. Okay, uh, injure in object add. 3.4 um, list.add. So list is supposed to hold integer objects. And so this isn't going to work because you would need to, you would need to, first of all, it's a double and you need an int. So you'd have to do something like, um, new integer object and then you would need to cast the double to an int first so i think you need to do that dot add all of this would need to be in there let's not add six uh spot six to nine well that's gonna be out of bound well no that'd be that'd be okay because that's the add feature so it would add well it would add it spot six which i guess works even though the spot doesn't exist as oh this is the same as like adding on to the end and you're adding a nine. Um, I don't, I think maybe it will, uh, there's something called auto wrapping or something like that, where it'll automatically change it to an, an object. So the, the thing here was more that we had a double, but I guess we can get away with not saying new integer, but this will add it to a legitimate spot. Remove spot six. That's going to give an error because there is no spot six. Uh, this one says set. Well, set would change the value that's at currently at six and put this in. Well, that's not going to work because there is no spot six. If you do add, you could do that. So we're going to go with C. Um, this is going to give you index out of bounds. And this is going to give you index out of bounds. Okay, uh, 24, refer to the method insert below. Uh, param list array list of string objects, param element string uh, element a string object, precondition list contains string value stored in decreasing order. 
element inserted in the correct position. How do we make sure it gets in the correct position? Like alphabetical order, strings, right? Public void insert, you have a list of strings, which is going to be an array list, and then you have the new thing you got to put in there. And it says, in index equals zero, while element, the current thing, is compared to list.getIndex is less than zero. That would mean, because it's in decreasing order, right? It's in decreasing order. If this is negative, that means that this is um, going to be, this is to the left before this. So we haven't gotten to the right spot yet. And so then we keep increasing index and keep checking until it's not less than. So it could be either equal to or greater than. And then we found, I think, the first spot to go ahead and put that into the list. It seems good. Assuming that the type of element is compatible with the objects in the list, which is true statement about the insert method. It seems like it's going to work, but I don't know. It works as intended. It fails for all values. It, it may be special cases. If it fails, if element is greater than the first item in the list and works in all the other cases. If it's greater than the first item list, then that's where it's going to get put. So I think that'll it'll work for the first item list. It doesn't fail. It fails if element is smaller than the last item. Oh, that could be a thing because if it if it never finds one that's bigger than then this while loop keeps going and index keeps getting bigger, then we get out of bounds exception. So this might be the one. Uh, if it fails if f is smaller, this might be the true one. This might be true. I'm kind of leaning towards this one. These are too extreme. Um, I mean, I thought it would work, but I think I figured out that if it's never bigger than any of them, then you, you're, you have a problem. It fails if the element is greater than the first item or smaller than the last item in the list and works for all other cases. Now, it fails if it's smaller than the last item, right, but not greater than the first one. So... Okay, compare to. You guys are good at compare to, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, let's see if we can finish this up. 25. Consider the following code segment applied to list and array list integer values. Uh, this says uh, int ln equals list.size, and you have a for loop that goes through the size. List.add i plus 1 new integer object and it just makes the integer object for i um, and i plus one would add it to the end okay so object x equals list dot set um, i new integer i plus two this is confusing list is initially six one eight what will be the following execution of the code let's let's see if we can follow it six one eight Right, that's what's already in there, and so then we start at i equals zero, and the list length is three, by the way, right? And i equals zero, and it says we'll add uh, i plus one, so that would be one, a new integer object zero. So it squeezes a zero in to the first spot and moves everything down. That's what add does set does something different then it says object x equals list dot set i which is still zero um, to a new integer object of two now sets can actually replace it so now we have a two and then a zero and then a one and an eight okay then we go to i equals one and this is what we have now and so i equals one so we're going to replace this we're going to squeeze into the second spot it's going to be right here, actually, two, zero, and then we're going to put um, a one there, and it scoots everything else down. So I think that's good. And then in X is now when you do the set thing and you apply it to X, it actually changes the list. So uh, I equals one. So it, at uh, spot one, you're going to end up with a three, two, three, one, one, eight. Then we go to I equals two. This is the last one. 
This is what we have. Zero, one, two. So it's going to squeeze it in. Uh, well, it's going to put it in spot three, which is right there. So it's going to be uh, two, three, one, and it puts a two there, and then one, eight. And then x equals two, x, uh, well, uh, i equals two. So what's in the first, this spot's going to end up getting a four. So I think this is going to be the final output, two, three, four, two, one, eight, two, three, four, two, one, eight. And that's right. You just kind of have to follow the code, walk through the code. Okay, 26, 27, you have a coin class, coin, double value string, name, uh, constructor, getters, um, and uh, a dot equals method. Um, so, okay, and then a purse has a array list of coins, constructors, add method, adds a coin, double get total. So 26 says, here's the get total method in purse class. You want to get like the total like value, return the total value of the coins. And the coins themselves have a get value uh, getter. So we're probably gonna have to do that. So public, uh, which of the following is the correct replacement for the code? So we started at zero and then we return it when we're done. So this uses an, uh, a for each loop and goes through and copies the coins in here and then uh, gets the coin, coins.get. Uh, that doesn't seem to make sense. C is already a coin, so that one's out. Um, this one does the same thing and says coin value, but the value is supposed to be uh, a double. So this might make sense if this was a double. Um, and then you could put the value in there, but that one's out. This one, again, this is just weird. We already have a coin, so that one doesn't make sense. Here, we have a coin. Nope, this is supposed to be C right here, right? Uh, so that's wrong. And this one goes through and calls get value on each one and adds them. So this, is, this one's good, that one's good. Okay, 27 is the last problem. So, let's see, two coins are said to match each other. They have the same name or the same value. They may, you may assume that coins with the same name have the same value, and coins with the same value have the same name. So, both things will be true, but you can use either one to figure out. Boolean method find is added to the purse class, fine. And it says, Returns true if the if the purse has a coin that matches uh, the coin we're looking for. So you're looking for a certain coin. So it goes through with a for each loop, which is the correct replacement. You could say, well, the current one dot equals the one you gave us. If that's true, return true. Well, that seems good. It just checks the coin value. This one checks the name. It says get get the name. Um, this one doesn't change. This just checks the objects in general. This checks just the names, and that should work. This one checks just the values, and that should work. But, um, well, this is these are going to be doubles, by the way. And so doubles, you shouldn't use dot equals to. You'd have to use equal equals. That would make it work. So on a technicality, three is not going to work. It's going to be one and two only so gotta watch out for those tricks you got to remember your, your stuff right here these are doubles so all right that